Uh, okay, uh, just I'll ad lib an introduction here. Um, our speaker, our visitor today is uh, Jake, you know, of course, joining us virtually uh, from a couple stops down the red line. Uh, he'll, uh, Jake's a graduate student at Harvard, um, works with Kermit Vafa, as you can see here, and we'll discuss a uh, paper he wrote uh, recently um, with Cameron uh, that's garnered uh, a fair amount of interest uh, for its kind of connections um, drawn between the Swampland uh, community and the Swampland program um, and sort of the more ADS CFT uh, holography type, uh, type people and uh, in particular recent developments uh, concerning baby universes and replica wormholes, um, which have uh, been of great interest due to the black hole information problem and progress there, uh, and uh, specifically concerning tricky tidal bomb gravity. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll leave it to Jake. Um, I, I think you'll all enjoy what he has to say. Hopefully. Um, great, thank you for the, uh, for the introduction. Um, and I should say, you know, there's only so a couple of us here and I'm, you know, I do have a prepared presentation, but please feel free to interrupt with any questions or objections and complaints or whatever. Um, and perfectly happy to sort of go off on tangents and answer questions about whatever part of this you want. Um, so yeah, so as Matt said, um, this paper uh, sits in a part of these two ongoing conversations, right? This conversation about uh, the, the island and the ensemble and replica wormholes, um, JT gravity, as well as this conversation about the swampland. And I'm very excited to see a point of contact between these two communities um, because they're both trying to answer really, I think the same questions, right? The, the, the essential questions are what is quantum gravity? Um, what is the UV complete description of quantum gravity? And they're coming at it from very different perspectives but they should have a lot to say to each other because the system at the end of the day is the same. Um, so this is with my advisor, Kamran Vafa. Um, and I, I think my understanding is that there's been some discussion of, um, as you said, the you know, JT gravity, replica wormholes, et cetera, the island, um, but you might be less familiar with the swamp land. And I just wanna say now um, that the basic idea of the swamp land program is that quantum gravity is very unique and very non-generic from the perspective of effective field theory. So if you think about the space of all effective field theories, um, the subset of that space, which admit a UV completion into quantum gravity, is supposed to be very small. Um, in particular, our intuitions from effective field theory, we shouldn't expect them to apply to the case of quantum gravity. And so what we propose in this paper is a new small plan condition, um, so a new consistency condition on UV complete quantum gravity, that's very surprising from the perspective of effective field theory. Um, and that's why it's a small plan condition, but it also is, has to do with baby universes and I think is of interest as well to the holography uh, community. Um, okay. Does that work? Yeah. So um, the outline uh, for this talk, uh, I'm gonna start with an introduction. And then I'm gonna give some background on baby universes and alpha parameters um, and a lot of old ideas going back to people like Coleman and Giddings and Strominger um, that have also been made much more precise recently by people such as Sodchanker and Stanford, um, Maxfield and Merolf, as well as many others. Um, once that background is out of the way, um, I'm gonna tell you the basic physical hypothesis we're putting forward, which is this baby universe hypothesis. Um, and at this po that point in the talk, it's not gonna necessarily be clear why this baby universe hypothesis is something you should expect to be true. All I'm gonna say at that point is that the baby universe hypothesis, if you take it as a given, provides a clean resolution of the paradoxes of baby universes. Fine, well, well and good. So why should we actually expect it? Why should we believe it? And I should say that this is where, this is where the swamp land plays a big role. Um, because the swampland is a growing web of conjectures. I don't think we know the full picture. We don't know what the you know, most basic physical principles are, but we have a lot of different interrelated conjectures. Um, and what I'm gonna argue is that the baby universe hypothesis fits very neatly into that web. 
it's implied by certain other swamp and conjectures, and in turn, it, re it goes back and implies others. And so it fits very neatly into that growing picture. Of course, that's not a proof, that's just evidence. Um, but I think that the, the, the goal of that is going to be to convince you um, that the baby universe hypothesis is the expectation from the Swampland program. It's what we should expect is the case in, 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 in the absence of other reasons to not believe it. Um, once I've done that, um, I'm then going to go back and connect it back to holography and say what the baby universe hypothesis says about holography, what lessons we can learn. Um, and finally, I'll conclude and I think there's a, a very important further direction, and I'll point you there when we get there. Um, so I guess just at the beginning, does anyone have any questions about the you know plan of this talk or outline anything? Feel free to shout out if you want. Yeah, uh, I presume you'll tell us what a baby universe is, what the yes. alpha member is possible. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Um, I think I have to like not click on the other videos. I have to click back on the PDF anyway. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, okay. So to, for motivation, I want to start by highlighting a pretty basic tension in quantum gravity. And so this is a tension between two physical principles that we both believe are true in some sense, but give a very different picture of what quantum gravity is like. So the first is the Euclidean path integral. And the second is the holographic principle. And these are both things that we hold pretty dear, um, we think should make sense and should give a good description of quantum gravity. But they disagree pretty strikingly about the, no the nature of the degrees of freedom in quantum gravity. So the Euclidean path integral naively tells us that there's a degree of freedom at every point in space. And so it tells us that the number of the entropy scales with the volume of a region. Of course, that's not what we expect. We expect that quantum gravity is holographic and the entropy should scale with the surface area. And so if we expect both of these things to be true, we need to reconcile them. We need to figure out how both of these things can be true. So how the Euclidean path integral can provide an accurate description, even in the case of a holographic theory. And one thing I should say about what I think we've learned in the Swampland that wasn't clear to me before I started thinking about and, and learning, reading these papers, talking to people, is that holography isn't automatic. If you throw down random matter, random interactions, just random junk, you're not going to end up with a holographic theory. You won't have black hole microstates. And my understanding of what a lot of the Swampland is doing is that it's trying to provide the UV degrees of freedom that allow your theory to be holographic, that allow it to have black hole microstates and satisfy the holographic principle. Um, so this, this tension shows up in a lot of places. It shows up in the black hole information paradox, right? So holography tells us that black hole evaporation is unitary. The most naive Euclidean path integral, say Hawking's calculation tells us that it's not. Um, more sophisticated calculations give us some of the story, but maybe not all of it. Um, and so I think that this tension is playing a role all over the place. Um, and not surprisingly, the place I'm gonna talk about it um, is in the context of baby universes. So what I want to argue is that baby universes make this tension very sharp and very quantitative and something that we can actually study mathematically. Um, and so what's a baby universe? Um, so I, baby universe is, is a really cute term. Um, you know, Juan made the joke at Strings. He started talking about teenage universes that were rebellious and giving, you know, giving their parents a lot of headaches. Um, but baby universe is also a bit of a misleading term. Um, because the salient feature is not that they're small. Baby universe makes you think small universe. And the fact, it's not that they're small that's playing the key role, it's that they're closed. So a baby universe for this talk means a closed universe that exists as a disconnected piece of space with respect to a bulk universe that we're thinking about. So it's a closed compact manifold. It exists off in the void on its own doing its own thing. And from the perspective of the Euclidean path integral, we're forced to consider baby universes. So this uh, you know, contribution to the Euclidean path integral I've drawn here, if you think of this as Euclidean time, contains a handle, so a Euclidean wormhole, that if we slice it in the middle, describes a baby universe. And so this is some amplitude to produce and then absorb a baby universe. And so if we take the Euclidean path integral seriously, we have to contend with baby universes. 
okay, fine. Um, but what makes baby universes different than any other phenomenon I know of um, in quantum field theory? Why are they not just, okay, sure, baby universes are there, what's the issue? Um, the, the sort of the heart of the issue um, is that baby universes don't exist at any point in space and time. Um, Coleman puts it kind of, uh, kind of beautifully. Um, he says that baby universes are not in time, but in eternity. And what he means by that is that a baby universe is not attached to any specific location in space and time. It exists separate from space and time. It's its own universe. Um, and we're going to see this play a key role again and again throughout this talk. Um, this is really the reason why baby universes are different than other phenomena in physics. Okay, so let's get into it in a little bit more detail. So let me just give a sort of cartoon summary of why baby universes pose a threat to unitarity. So let's start with a state that we very heuristically write as, you know, psi is some state of baby universes tensored with some state of the EFT, so some tensor product state with no entanglement. So baby universes will appear and disappear and interact with the EFT. And under time evolution, we generically expect this to evolve to some state psi prime, which is some entangled superposition of the baby universes with the bulk. And this is not so surprising, right? This is just saying we have two quantum systems, they're interacting, and so they become entangled. Information flows from one system to the other system. But what we can do now is if we want to imagine the perspective of someone living in the EFT, we might want to trace out the baby universes. And if we trace out the baby universes, what we see is that an initially pure state of the effective field theory has evolved to a mixed density matrix. This is also not so surprising. This is what happens whenever we have two interacting quantum systems and we trace one out. Um, what's happening is that information about the EFT is becoming entangled with the baby universes. And if we trace them out, we lose it because we're forgetting about the state of the baby universes. Um, okay, so this just shows that they could potentially pose a problem. I don't think that this is an airtight argument, but this is sort of the heuristic issue. The issue is that baby universes can let information escape and go away off on their own, and you need to contend with that if you want to understand unitarity of the EFT. Um, cool. Yeah, so, so the, the, the key point is there's uh, more than one element in that sum. The key point is that there's more than one element in that sum. Exactly, exactly. The key point is that there's more than one element because, exactly, because when you trace over this, you get a mixed state. Whereas if there's only one element in that sum, even when you trace over it, you still get a pure state. Exactly right. Um, yeah, so not to spoil the punchline too much, but that's, that's sort of the point. Um, yeah. So, um, no, good. I mean, I, I don't think it, you know, in some sense, what I'm going to be saying is not so sophisticated. I was honestly asking the question, just thinking like a, you know, a quantum information student, and I, I really didn't uh, realize how I was, yeah, anticipating yeah. The next slide or something. Well, a couple slides later, um, but yeah, no, 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 very good. Um, so before we get to what Matt was essentially proposing, um, let's just say let's let's understand how Coleman analyzed this system because I think we should be a little bit more precise than what I've been on this slide. I think this is a little bit wishy-washy. Um, Coleman's argument is even still a little bit wishy-washy. Um, it's, I think, very cleanly outlined in Merrill and Maxfield's paper where they have the tools of ADS-CFT um, to sort of make sure you're on firm mathematical ground. Um, but I'm going to go through Coleman's argument about how we understand uh, this process of interaction with baby universes. Is, is this actually an issue or is this not an issue? So the question that Coleman addresses is how do we integrate out baby universes? So in order to integrate out baby universes, we need to describe their interaction with an EFT. So Coleman introduces these operators, these AIs and AI daggers, which are baby universe creation and annihilation operators. So I labels different species of baby universe, maybe different shapes, um, different matter content, whatever. Um, I just is some index. And AIs and AI daggers are just ordinary bosonic creation and annihilation operators that create these baby universes. And we want to incorporate the fact that baby universes exist out in the void. And one consequence of that, very, very simple consequence of that, is that we must have that these AIs and AI daggers 
are independent of space and time. This statement isn't so mysterious if we take its Fourier transform. This says that the baby universe operators, the baby universes, must contain zero momentum and zero energy. But that's expected um, because in quantum gravity, uh, translations are gauged. And so momentum and energy are gauge charges. And we have Gauss's law. In a closed universe, we can't have any net gauge charge. Um, so closed universes can't have any momentum or any energy. Um, this is a version of the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Um, and the upshot is just that these operators are not dependent on space and time. What that means is that when we try to write down an effective action like this, uh, I'll explain what the terms are, we can pull them out of the integral over space time. Let me explain what the terms in this effective action are. So S0 is some action describing the EFT fields without baby universes taken into account. The second term is the interesting one, and it describes the interaction of baby universes with the bulk. So for each species AI, so I star is going to be the CPT conjugate of AI. And so this interaction term describes the process of attaching a baby universe to the bulk at some point. Um, so LI is some local operator in the bulk in the EFT that's inserted when a baby universe attaches to the, it's, it's at some point in space time and it's inserted by a baby universe attaching or detaching. Um, is this action clear? Um, what the physics of this action are? Can you just comment on why you have to have A plus A dagger? Is it something to do with hermeticity? It's hermeticity. Yeah, exactly. B basic, right? It's, it's, it, if you have a, a bulk universe and then a baby universe attaches like this, right? You can either bend it into the future or you can bend it into the past. And in one situation, you're creating the universe going forward in time. And in the other one, you're creating it going back. You're annihilating it from the coming backwards in time. And so that's why you have AI and then AI star dagger. So it's the one that annihilates the CPT conjugate. Yeah. Is it like uh, you could imagine doing one or the other of those things, but uh, you know, diffeomorphism invariance tells you that's not OK? Um, yeah, I think diffeomorphism invariance, but I also think just the, the statement that the action should be, the Lagrangian should be real. It's, it's hermeticity. Well, yeah, I mean, that, it seems like the only sensible thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like if you have, you know, it's normal, it's the usual thing in quantum field theory, right? If you have some term in a Lagrangian, you should add the Hermitian conjugate. For sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so this is, this is the action. And we'd like to solve this action. And right, right now, we've just described the interaction of baby universes. We'd like to understand what the solution is, what's the upshot. And luckily, we actually can. So the key fact is that these operators that appear in the action, which I'm going to call big AI, all mutually commute. And what's the reason for that? Well, AI describes attaching a baby universe. Oh, sorry, it, it, it describes creating a baby universe. But if, what does it mean that they, would, for them not to commute? It would mean that it matters what order in time I put the baby universes. But baby universes have no notion of order in time. They exist outside of time. Um, if you want a more precise argument, you could see this from the path integral and the boundary conditions that define AI have no notion of the order in which you insert them. And so these operators commute. Um, does anyone want me to say more about that or is that enough? If you have more to say, then maybe you should say it, but I don't have anything specific yeah. more. Okay. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the fact that they mutually commute means that we can find um, simultaneous eigenvalues. Um, I'm going to call them alpha uh, eigenvectors labeled by alpha. And in the state alpha, these baby universe operators AI take the value alpha i. Um, if you've read Mallard from Maxwell's paper, these AIs they call z. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm using Coleman's notation. Yes. Yeah, yeah. See, for me, that completely clarified it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Um, so what happens in an alpha eigenstate? Well, we can, if we're working in an alpha eigenstate, we can replace this quantum operator in our action with a C number, with its eigenvalue, its eigenvalue alpha i. And now this action is not so mysterious. This is just some bare action plus some new terms in the Lagrangian with coupling constants alpha i. 
And so the upshot is that the net effect of the baby universes in an alpha eigenstate is to modify the coupling constants of your Lagrangian. So each choice of alpha defines a unitary EFT on its own with different values of the coupling constants. OK, so what does this tell us about unitarity? So I want to reemphasize the full system is not unitary. Um, if we start in some superposition of different alpha eigenstates and we let it evolve in time, we lose track about the, of, of the relative phases between different alpha eigenstates. We, we can't measure those from the EFT. And so the whole system is not unitary. Just to be clear, you mean the fully integrated out system? Yes. Right. I mean, if, if you, if you right. have an oracle that lets you measure the state of the, if you have an oracle that lets you measure the phases, of course, you can keep track of the phases. But the point is that they're not measurable from the EFT. Yeah. We don't think about crazy things like that, like quantum information theorists do. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I mean that from the perspective of the EFT, you lose information. Yeah. For the same reason as before. This hasn't solved that issue. But it lets us make the following argument. Even though information is being lost, we can't tell. We interpret this loss of information as, of a, la as a lack of our precise knowledge of the values of these coupling constants. When we do some experiment and we find that it violates unitarity, instead of saying that, oh, our system's not unitary, we update our understanding of the probability distribution on the coupling constants in our theory. But differently, the end result is that we shouldn't talk about quantum superpositions of different alpha eigenstates. We should talk about statistical mixtures. We should talk about an ensemble of theories, each of which is a unitary quantum system, even though the entire system is not a unitary quantum theory. So this is why we end up with an ensemble from the perspective of baby universes. And this is, as argued by many people, supposed to be identified with the ensemble in, say, the SYK model or a matrix model that have been discussed a lot in the holography community. So what do we think of this, of this argument? So I should say this argument holds water. It's logically valid, it's physically reasonable, and the conclusion holds up to scrutiny, it's fine. But I personally find it a bit unsatisfying. And the reason I find it unsatisfying is that I don't think this is really a solution of what it means to say that quantum gravity is unitary. My understanding of things like the black hole information paradox are not supposed to be, it's not unitary, but you can't tell. It's supposed to be that it's just unitary. And in, in the absence of any alternative, I would probably just say, OK, sure, this is how it is. But what I want to argue is that there is an alternative. And in fact, we can do better. So how would we do better, right? The issue is that we have an ensemble. Okay. Like I'm just the same comment I made a second ago, but it is unitary from the perspective of the like uh, baby universe Hilbert space, the extended Hilbert space, you know, uh, right? Um, it's, it's it's like I'm talking about the uh, purification versus uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think it's it's unitary in the sense that you can always take a non-unitary quantum description of a system and purify it. Well, I it's. Yes, but there at least is like a, you know, quantum gravity interpretation to that, like a bulk interpretation to that, with, to do with these um, baby universes. Or am I kind of missing something? I um, I missing well, something. I think, I think maybe one thing to say is that, um, what, what does it mean for a quantum gravity theory to be unitary, right? It means that the measurements we can make um, we, we can keep track of the quantum coherence of the state. And here, if we're living, say, by an ADS, out by an ADS boundary, we lose track of the quantum coherence, the relative phases between different alpha eigenstates. Um, because we don't, we, the only, let me, maybe I should say this. The only way from the bulk that we can probe the baby universes is through these operators, big AI, and those operators are diagonal on the alpha eigen basis, and so they can't measure the relative phases. Yeah, I, I certainly agree um, from that perspective. Yeah. I agree with all your comments. I was just trying to say you could insist on this. You, you, know, you, could, you, could, you could insist that this is just how it is. Um, 
Right, but you, you could insist that you know some uh, oracle or like a superior being with access mm -hmm. to the um, full non-traced out Hilbert space does have those relative phases, and there is a unitary thing that exists, but or no. Well, uh, uh, you you could you could say that, um, but for the perspective of like, is black hole evaporation unitary? It wouldn't. I don't think it would count as saying yes. I agree with you there. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for clarifying. The information becomes unaccessible. We couldn't reconstruct it using a quantum computer. Yep. Which I think is the operative, the operative question. Yeah, good. Um, so yeah, so, so the, the, the issue I have with this is, is, most, is, is taste, is expectation, is whatever. This is a fine resolution, but I just want to point out that there's a different resolution which doesn't have these issues. And in order to do better, we have to get rid of this ensemble. So how could we do that? What if there were only one alpha eigenstate? What if instead of a bunch of different alpha eigenstates, there were only one? In that case, we wouldn't have an ensemble. We would have a specific unitary theory. And so this is the basic hy physical hypothesis that we're making in this paper. So um, we're calling it baby universe hypothesis. And the statement is that in a UV complete theory of quantum gravity, small caveat with in more than three space-time dimensions, and I'll talk, say more about that, um, but in such a UV complete theory of quantum gravity, we're claiming that the Hilbert space of baby universes should be one dimensional. And if we just take this as a given, if we just assume that this is the case, it solves the issues I was just describing. So what happens with unitarity? So this guarantees unitarity. I'm really sorry to keep interrupting, but- Yeah, no, no, please. I, I can't remember um, whether you stated or not that what HBU is, it's right this like, is it a Fox space or something over the uh, harmonic oscillators of the? Um, I'll say in a, in two slides what oh, okay, I mean, okay, which, sorry. which definition of HBU I'm going to use. Yeah, I, I mean I mean the gauge invariant Hilbert space of whatever the properly defined physical baby universe states is. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. Um, whether that has a Fox space description, I think, is the next point I'm about to get to. Um, but let's just take this as a given for a second. Um, and I just want to point out that this guarantees unitarity. Um, what's happening is that I'm not just declaring by fiat that baby universes don't appear and disappear. What I'm saying is that even though baby universes are appearing and disappearing, because they have no capacity for information, even though information tries to go get lost in the baby universes, it can't go anywhere. And it stays in the effective field theory. Um, right, the issue before was that they were, the, the bulk EFT was becoming entangled with the state of baby universes. And if the baby universes are, are in a fixed unique state, there's no entanglement possible. Um, uh, a phrasing that I, I like of this is that this is Gauss's law for entropy in quantum gravity. This says that a closed universe should have vanishing net entropy in quantum gravity. Um, yeah. Okay, now I wanna point out that this is very weird. <laughs> This would not be the expectation of anyone in an effective field theory. From the perspective of an effective field theory, how is it possible that there's no degrees of freedom in a closed universe? There's fluctuating fields all over the place. How could this be the case? And all I'll say now about that, I'll say more in a second, um, is that this means that it's a swampland condition. This means that it's not at all our expectation from the perspective of effective field theory. It's something very non-generic, very constraining, um, that might be true only in you know, theories that admit a UV completion as a theory of quantum gravity. Um, so let me just comment on the restriction on the dimension. So this restriction is essential. Um, at least d bigger than two is provably essential um, because JT gravity, for example, is a solved system. Saad Shanker and Stanford have completely solved the system. We know everything there is to know about it and it has an ensemble. It has an ensemble of alpha eigenstates and, and there's nothing more to say, it just is this way. Um, but I'll comment more on why JT gravity is an exception and not characteristic of higher dimensional theories. I do think there's ongoing discussions about the non-perturbative completion. Um, uh, that's fair, that's fair. Yeah, that's fair. Um, I guess from the perspective of, of this type of question, pure JT gravity has an ensemble without any debate, I think, at this point. Yeah. Hands down. Um, 
So let me, let me just address this, this point about how could, how could the baby universe have a one baby universe have a one dimensional Hilbert space. That's a very strong claim. And in particular, we, I have to say what could happen to the degrees of freedom in a baby universe, right? There's, as I said, from the very beginning, there are fluctuating fields at every point in space in the baby universe. How could it be that there's no degrees of freedom at the end of the day? So what needs to happen is that we need new gauge redundancies. The counting from the EFT's perspective of the number of degrees of freedom in baby universes has to be an overcounting. And the only way to get rid of an overcounting is to subtract some off, which is to say that we want gauge redundancies, which identify states that we thought were different naively. And in fact, such gauge redundancies have been described. So a first example of them um, comes if we think about the thermal field double state. So the thermal field double state um, is this in the context of, of two um, two different CFT, two copies of a CFT is a specific entangled superposition of states in the two CFTs. And it's supposed to be dual to the bulk ADS Schwarzschild wormhole, which is a connected geometry, whereas on the right hand side, each of these states is a disconnected geometry. Um, right, as I said, this, the state of the ADS Schwarzschild wormhole is equal to the superposition of disconnected states. And what Jaffer has pointed out is that this means that the topology of the universe, at least something like the number of connected components, is not a gauge invariant observable in quantum gravity. If it were, the left-hand side and the right-hand side would have to be orthogonal because they have different values of the number of connected components. And so this tells us that something like the topology of the universe is not quite gauge invariant in quantum gravity because there's overlap between the two sides. In fact, in this example, they're just equal. Um, this was pushed further um, recently by Marilyn von Maxfield. And so they construct this baby universe Hilbert space that you were asking about, taking these gauge redundancies into account. And so the way they do that is they start with some naive, there's some naive states, just quantum superpositions of classical configurations. Um, say here, psi one and psi two, psi one has you know, two components, psi two has three components. And we define an inner product by integrating over bulk um, topologies and geometries that fill it in. And so this defines an inner product, uh, which is positive semi-definite, but it might have null states. It might have states of zero norm. And so in order to define a Hilbert space, we should quotient our naive Hilbert space by the null states. And in Merrill and Maxfield's toy model, they actually find that this quotient reduces the size of the Hilbert space quite dramatically. Um, it doesn't find it to be, they don't find it to be one dimensional, but they find it to be much smaller than the naive count. And what we're saying um, in this paper is that they don't quite go far enough uh, for higher dimensional and more realistic theories of quantum gravity. So our hypothesis says that this quotient, by taking these gauge redundancies into account, they should be so strong as to collapse the Hilbert space down to one dimension. So that's, that's how it's logically possible for this to happen. Now let me argue that not only is it logically possible, but it's the expectation from the perspective of the Swampland program. So let me pause here to see if there are any other questions. So I have a question about the like a, the the what the baby universe is like. Mm -hmm. a, if we imagine as a like a some some closed space, right? But we can equally well take some a set of points and define some sort of quantum mechanical system there, right? So what's going on? Like I can all consider all of those possibilities, and then and at the end it will also give one dimension. Is that the claim, or like just for the closed universe where we have a nice? You know, so the I'm I'm not sure I completely understand your question. the The claim is that um, if you consider only closed universes in quantum gravity, that yeah. What, what do you mean by universe? That's that's my question. Like, so I, I can um, take a set of points as a universe and define some quantum mechanical systems. So are you imagining, say, a, a, a quantum theory of gravity in one space-time dimension? So spatial slices are... No, no, what I'm imagining is like the, you at this uh, operator, like AI, star, uh, dagger, AI, LI, right? It's just like adding something to, to the actual space, right? So that, that, that yeah, yeah off, off disconnected, just off yeah, by yeah. I can I can add some some shape where there are singularities on it or like some weird topologies or anything that I want to be honest. 
like it doesn't have to be closed space, right? So um, those cases as well. Th that's a good point. Um, so when I say that the baby universe is a closed space, I don't necessarily mean that it's a smooth manifold of that dimension. Mm -hmm. I mean it's 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 whatever is dynamically allowed in your theory of quantum gravity. Okay, so we say everything, uh, you know, in, you know, anything that. Anything, anything closed, anything that doesn't have an asymptotic boundary. So, okay. right. So for example, I don't mean adding a whole nother universe that has another ADS boundary, sure. a whole nother universe that has another flat space boundary. Uh, for example, like a set of points is also allowed. In that case. Is what? Set of points is also allowed. Like there's like a... Yeah, yeah. Well, 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 no, no if, if, as well. if that's allowed in your theory of quantum gravity, right? I, I don't sure. think it's obvious that quantum gravity allows any type of singularity, but it's obvious, it is true from our experience in string theory, right, that quantum gravity mm -hmm. allows plenty of singularities and non-geometric crap and, and whatever whatever is possible. Yeah. When I say closed universe, I just mean no asymptotic. There is, it might be possible. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is yeah. there a way to make sense of that in the case of uh, non-geometric stuff? I guess it's just like you define it by saying there has to be a you know, classically geometric asymptotic boundary um, and that's what's not allowed? Um, so that's a really good question. Um, and that's a question that's being discussed a lot in the Swamp Land program because I don't think we have a really complete understanding of what non-geometric back backgrounds in, in string theory look like. You know, for string theory compactifications, we have a clear sense. They're a world sheet CFT <laughs> of some fixed central charge. Um, but I don't think we understand what the proper notion of compact non-geometric space is. Presumably there is one, um, but pinning that down is a big part of defining non-perturbative string theory. So I think it's a really good question, uh, but I don't know the answer. Um, one, th one thing to say is that um, it, should, it should be something sort of finite. Um, it should be something that has a finite spatial extent to whatever degree the notion of spatial extent makes sense. It should be compact. Um, but making sense of what it means to be compact for something more general than a manifold or a topological space uh, is hard. But it's a good question. It's a very important question. Yeah, I wasn't expecting you to have a, uh, you know, <laughs> answer. But, but, you know, it doesn't matter for your argument, right? It might be anything. Is that, I'm not, like it's still because like when, when this like inner product shows up, mm -hmm. there's always I, I think there's always some assumptions about the you know the, the, the things being a manifold, like smooth manifold. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think I think this, this is this is um yeah something that's really got in my way of trying to think about these things is that it's really hard to have toy models. Mm -hmm. um, What's nice about like Merrill Maxfield's paper and JT Gravity is that they're nice to point models where you can specify what's allowed. And what's allowed is just smooth manifolds. Yeah. So the, I, I, I don't know if it will generalize to higher dimensions. I, 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 I agree. No. Um, there are orbifolds like. Well, you, I mean, you could, you could choose not to include orbifolds, right? Yeah, uh, sure, but you know. I mean, we should, you know, like it depends who you ask, to be honest. <laughs> I 100% I, 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 I agree with your perspective. Um, and, and the answer is that for, for what I'm talking about, this, this cartoon picture mm -hmm. should be whatever is the proper thing that goes into the quantum gravity path integral. Okay. Um, okay. I think a fair objection would be that what if quantum gravity isn't defined by a path integral, then I mean whatever goes into whatever the analog of a path integral in quantum gravity is. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that, 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 like a, that's the dangerous thing about it. Like, a, like if, if, if the argument at any point depends on the smooth manifold, then yep. it, yeah, I don't know if it, 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 if it doesn't depend on it. My, my understanding of it is that it doesn't depend on there being a smooth manifold. Um, mm -hmm. if, if you want more, um, this is actually something that Cameron and I discussed in our, our previous paper, which is very about very similar ideas on, on cobordism and quantum gravity. Um, most of what we talk about in that paper is smooth manifolds, but we're careful to phrase things in such a way that they only make sense of things that are physically meaningful. And so something like an internal space being a smooth manifold is not physically meaningful, 
right? It might be dual by mirror symmetry or something to something yeah, that's not. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So there, there might be some like weird things, but there are like additional gauge invariances that, that like some T duals or something. Ab absolutely. Um, so, so what I mean by Hilbert space of baby universes here is the, the Hilbert space of quantum gravity defined with no asymptotic boundaries. Okay. Yeah. I think. And, and I think that that, that, that alone makes sense. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I agree. Yeah, good. Um, cool. Um, any other questions? Cool. Um, so let's go on to the Swampland program. Um, so I have this, this picture that I think you're compelled to put in any talk on the Swampland, um, which is this picture of the, this web of Swampland conjectures. And from the very structure of this picture, it's not, um, this isn't exhaustive, but from the very structure, you can see that we have just a scattering of different conjectures. We don't have basic axioms and then we derive theorems. We have a bunch of things that we think are true and relationships between them. And some of them we believe more strongly and some of them we have less evidence for. But in general, these are things that agree with our expectation in string theory and we can have good physical arguments for. So Sorry, the, I have a question about this picture. Yeah. So what does the links between the nodes mean? Is that like implication or? Very, very good question. Um, it means different things depending on the line. Some of them are implications. Um, for example, the weak gravity conjecture certainly implies that there are no global symmetries. Um, uh, there's various implications between them, but a line means a connection. <laughs> okay. Um, and, you know, People have different perspectives on this. Um, I think people, Hiroshi Oguri, for example, has been giving a talk where he's emphasizing that it'd be nice to elevate Swampland conjectures to the level of things that could be proven. Um, but part, part, of, part of my perspective is that the goal of the Swampland isn't to make statements about a well-defined mathematical object. It's to find the axioms, it's to find the right axioms. And part of the issue is that we're trying to describe quantum gravity in terms of the language of quantum field theory. And so we have to be a little bit wishy-washy because quantum gravity is not a quantum field theory. And we need to figure out what the more proper notion of quantum gravity is, and then we should try to prove them. I'm not saying that means proof is not relevant, but it does mean that we should take these as physical principles more so than precise statements about a specific mathematical formalism, except in things like the case of ADS-CFT or specific Calabi-Yau compactifications where we do have a, a mathematical footing. Um, so, so let, let me say, the part, the three I'm going to use, which are these three, stand in what I would consider the very, the more rigorous corner of the swampland. So the three swampland conditions that I'm going to talk about are no free parameters, no global symmetries, and the cobordism conjecture. No global symmetries has even been claimed to be proven in the context of ADS-CFT um, by Daniel Harlow and Hiroshi Oguri. Um, of course, that proof makes assumptions. It make, assumes that entanglement wedge reconstruction works. It makes assumptions about the nature of holography. But I think it's a pretty airtight argument otherwise. Um, no global symmetries is something that has existed since before the Swampland program. There's arguments for it from black hole physics. Um, I would say that this corner is, is on relatively firm footing. Um, yeah. So let me get into it. So the first Swampland argument I want to make is from no free parameters. So I'm going to argue that no free parameters implies the baby universe hypothesis. So what does it mean to say that there are no free parameters? Well, it means that any parameter in quantum gravity must be promoted to a dynamical field. So one example of that is the string coupling, which is the value of the diloton. So it's a dynamical field. It's not something that you freeze and define one theory versus another, except when you specify a vacuum but not when you specify the theory. So this is a version of background independence. If we had a free parameter, then we would have a theory of quantum gravity that depends on which background you put it on, as opposed to a theory in which everything is dynamical. So what does this say about alpha parameters? Could alpha parameters be dynamical fields? Well, let's see. If they were, then we could imagine a configuration where these fields phi took their VEV off for most of space, 
but in some finite region, fluctuate off to some other value. But what does this mean if these are supposed to be alpha parameters? Alpha parameters are independent of space-time. And I've just said that if they're given by dynamical fields, then they must be able to fluctuate up across spatial directions. And this is a contradiction. So we learn that alpha parameters are not dynamical fields. And so, as a consequence, are ruled out by the swamp plane condition of no free parameters. It's not a very complicated argument. Um, whether you believe it, I think, depends on how strongly you believe the statement that there are no free parameters in quantum gravity. But certainly, if there are no free parameters in quantum gravity, then we can't have alpha parameters as they are an example of a free parameter. Well, does it make an uh, assumption about the definition of dynamics in relation to classical geometry? Good. Um, well, a very vague question. I apologize for it. So, so yeah, I, I can say something about that. So, um, when I say that I have a theory of quantum gravity in some dimension, right? I mean that it can be defined. It's a, I have a vacuum of quantum gravity, and I can define it um, in, say, asymptotic. Let me just phrase it in terms of asymptotically Minkowski space. We could also talk about it in ADS, but let me just say asymptotically Minkowski because that's how I'm thinking about it. Um, so this is a picture in asymptotically Minkowski space. And um, the, the assumption when we say that is that we have a theory of quantum gravity with a low energy effective field theory, which means that it makes sense to talk about, approximately talk about things like bulk locality. And so in that sense, this picture makes sense. I'm not assuming anything about the geometry of an internal manifold, if there is one, but I'm assuming that we're talking about a theory of quantum gravity that has large geometry looks something like Einstein gravity. Um, because that's, I don't know what else you could possibly mean by a theory of quantum gravity in a fixed dimension with asymptotic Minkowski boundaries. Um, does, that, does that help with that? It does. Yeah, good. Any other questions or complaints about this argument? Okay. Um, so now let me uh, connect it to a different swamp land conjecture. So this is the cobordism conjecture, uh, which is due to Cameron and I. Um, and so what is this conjecture? This says that um, all quantum gravity backgrounds in a fixed dimension must be connected by a dynamical domain wall. Um, what I mean by that is if you have two theories of quantum gravity, you have to be able to connect them by a finite tension domain wall. Um, what that means is that you can open up a bubble of one theory of quantum gravity inside a finite region of the other, it means that the only sense in which quantum gravity is disconnected is in, this, in the limit of infinite space with different vacua. So why do I call this cobordism? Well, if you, if you think that it comes from an internal manifold, M, and some other internal manifold, N, then if we have some cobordism, so some manifold of one higher dimension that connects M to N, the region in the middle will behave as a domain wall between the theories of quantum gravity in the lower dimension. Now, this statement doesn't assume that there's an internal manifold. That's just explaining why I call it cobordism. The argument for, um, for this conjecture is that if this weren't the case, we could define a conserved charge that tells us which background we're in. And because there's no domain wall, that charge would be exactly conserved. And quantum gravity is not supposed to have conserved charges. Um, if you're in a case, where your theory does come from a theory in higher dimensions compactified, then it's just a normal uh, higher form symmetry in the higher dimension. It's a little bit weirder if the internal manifold isn't, doesn't have any notion of higher, higher dimension. Um, but nevertheless, you can define a conserved charge. And I think this conjecture has stood up to a number of, of basic tests. So what's the argument for the baby universe hypothesis from the cobordism conjecture? Well, it's what I just said a second ago. If that theories with different values of alpha cannot be connected by any domain wall. And in fact, the cobordism conjecture and the baby universe hypothesis are basically equivalent. They both say that quantum gravity cannot have any superselection sectors in finite space because a superselection sector would correspond to a conserved charge. Um, so these, these two are basically equivalent, and they're, they're both equivalent to the statement that the only way to get superselections in sectors in quantum gravity is from the infinite volume of space when you have an asymptotic boundary. Um, cool. So now let me go backwards, and I'm going to derive, rederive the statement of no global symmetries from the baby universe hypothesis. Let me just check time. Cool. 
So, yeah, okay. You have until four. Cool. Um, so, no global symmetries says that any exact symmetry of quantum gravity should be gauged. Um, and let's derive that from the baby universe hypothesis. So let's assume for the sake of contradiction that we had a global symmetry. So what can we do? We can take our baby universe Hilbert space and write it as a direct sum over irreducible representations of the global symmetry of some subspaces H rho. Now, all of these subspaces should be non-trivial. Um, if, if you have a state in one of them, you should be able to act with a local operator to go to some state in a with a different, transforming in a different representation. Um, there have to be such local operators because otherwise our symmetry wouldn't act faithfully on local operators and it wouldn't be meaningful to call it a symmetry, right? A symmetry that acts trivially on everything in your theory isn't really a symmetry. Your symmetry should act faithfully on the physical degrees of freedom. Okay, so if the group is non-trivial, we have more than one irrep, and so a global symmetry implies that the baby universe Hilbert space is more than one dimensional. This isn't that surprising. All I'm saying is that baby universes can carry global charge and that distinguishes different baby universe states. And you can't, they can't be connected. They have zero overlap if they have different values of the global charge. And so they can't be related by these gauge redundancies. This is not the case for gauge charge. Gauge symmetries are fine because we have Gauss's law and we can't have any net gauge charge in a compact, in a closed universe. And so the baby universe Hilbert space can still be one dimensional, even in the presence of a gauge symmetry. So that's the argument there. Um, so that, that's what I have to say about the connection with the Swamp Land program. Um, does anyone have any questions about that? Objections? Yeah, again, the key point is like the closed nature of the baby universes. Exactly. It's the, it's the fact that they're closed. It's the fact that they're closed and finite um, and not asymptotic to anything. Um, yeah, so, so just, just to summarize what I said in terms of the Swampland, what I, the way I view it is that the baby universe hypothesis fits neatly inside this growing web of conjectures. And it's implied by some conjectures and it implies others. And so if you believe that the Swampland program is getting at something, then this is what I think is the natural expectation. You should take it seriously that this is a possibility. So now let me move away from the swampland and talk about holography. So the first lesson for holography um, is that the baby universe hypothesis is implied by standard ADS CFT. So when I say standard ADS CFT, I mean like in the example of n equals four super Yang mills being dual to type two B on ADS five cross S five. Um, I mean that I have a single conformal field theory. I have no ensemble and it's dual in the strictest sense as an equality of quantum systems. So what does it mean to have a CFTD? One thing it means is that to every D minus one manifold, closed D minus one manifold, which you think of as the asymptotic boundary of the ADS slice, we can associate a Hilbert space. So it's the CFT Hilbert space quantized on M. And the key point about holography is not just that we have a quantum system on the boundary, but that we have a local quantum system on the boundary. And so boundary locality says many things, but one very basic formal statement of boundary locality is that if we quantize our CFT on a disjoint union of two manifolds, that Hilbert space should be the tensor product of the Hilbert space quantized on each manifold. That's just saying that if you have two dis disconnected spaces that you put the CFT on, they're independent quantum systems, and so the Hilbert space is the tensor product. That's a version of locality. Okay, so what does that mean in the case of the baby universe Hilbert space? Where do we find the baby universe Hilbert space in the CFT? So where is the baby universe Hilbert space? The baby universe Hilbert space is the Hilbert space of bulk geometries, states, that have no asymptotic ADS boundaries. It's the Hilbert space of the CFT quantized on the empty manifold. And one of the axioms, so if, if the Hilbert space for a disjoint union should be the tensor product, the Hilbert space for a disjoint union of no manifolds should be the unit for tensor product of Hilbert spaces. And that's the Hilbert space C, the trivial Hilbert space. From the perspective of the CFT, this is not deep at all. This is completely trivial. But if we, the, the, the magic happens is if we interpret, if we take a very strict reading of ADS CFT and interpret this Hilbert space of the CFT on the empty manifold as the Hilbert space of baby universes because then we learn that the baby universe hypothesis should be true. 
course, you can object and you can say, maybe we're supposed to modify our CFT diction ADS CFT dictionary. Fine, maybe I'm supposed to think about it differently. But if I just follow my nose and assume it holds in the strictest and most naive sense, we learn that the baby universe hypothesis is true from standard ADS CFT. Another aspect of standard ADS CFT that's come under a lot of discussion um, so that, yeah, is the factorization of multi-boundary partition functions. So Maroff and Maxfield um, do a nice calculation in the context of these alpha eigenstates, and they show that the partition function calculated by the Euclidean path integral on a on, on a multi -bound with multiple boundaries, x1 and x2, is given by the ensemble average over this ensemble of alpha eigenstates of the products of the two CFT partition functions. So here, uh, p alpha is the probability to be in an alpha eigenstate. So the baby universe set hypothesis says that there's only one alpha eigenstate. And so there's only one term in this sum, and so the partition function factorizes. Cool. This is just another example um, of saying that factorization follows from the axioms of standard C ADS CFT. But I want to emphasize, uh, it's not a point that's new to us, this is a point that many people have made, but, this, but I, I want to interpret it as sort of a version of space-time ER equals EPR. It implies that there's a relationship, there's a cancellation between connected and disconnected contributions to the partition function. I'm claiming that if the baby universe hypothesis is true, the, the quantum gravity path integral must arrange itself to factorize, even though it naively doesn't have to. It must imply enormous cancellations, enormous condition, constraints on the degrees of freedom and interactions, which is why this is a swampland condition. It's not for free. It doesn't come for free. It's very special. Um, good, OK. Um, I just want to make sure I have enough time. OK. I think I have like two more slides. Um, you can go over two. This is like sometimes we run half an hour late. It's fine. OK, yeah, sure. Uh, well, it'd be good. It'd be good to have time for discussion if people want. Also, yeah. Um, so, actually, in that context, let me let me let me pause here and see if people have have questions about this. Cool. I don't think I'm saying anything particularly profound. Um, I'm just saying that if we follow ADS CFT in the most strict and uh, straightforward sense it's consistent with the baby universe hypothesis and not with an ensemble. Yeah, I do think you're saying something worthwhile and very valuable though, not that you meant you weren't. <laughs> but like, you know, people just usually hand wave off this possibility. Like, of course, that sounds kind of crazy. But I mean, you've given a very compelling argument over the course of the talk, I think, for why it coming, especially from a swampland perspective. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think, and I think the swamp, that, that's, one, that's where the, the perspective of the swampland is really powerful. Um, because if we get trapped into thinking that quantum gravity, that our expectations about physics coming from effective field theory just apply to quantum gravity, we're going to get very confused. And we're going we're, 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 we to, should, we should treat quantum gravity in terms of the things that are meaningful for quantum gravity. Um, Dan, Dan Harlow said at, at Strings, I, I really liked it, he said, you know, he, he was arguing for, for this specific type of cancellation. And he, what he was saying was that, you know, if it's very surprising, but it has to be that way for it to work formally, it usually happens, even if it's surprising. And it's usually a sign that there's some underlying structure that we don't understand yet. Um, so that's sort of what I'm arguing for. Some Einstein quote for that, right? Yeah, yeah, make everything as simple as possible, but no simpler. Yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. And, and you know, and part of it is, you know, I'm not ready to give up on standard ADS CFT. I'm not ready to say that there should be an ensemble. I think standard ADS CFT captures things like ADS, uh, ADS five dual to n equals four super Yang mills perfectly well. Um, I don't think we should have to necessarily give that up yet. Um, yeah. But that leads nicely into my next slide, which is that if this is how we're supposed to think about physically reasonable theories of quantum gravity, what are we supposed to make of these counterexamples in low dimension like JT gravity? Right? We should address those. We shouldn't just say that these are, it's just not true in low dimensions. Why? Why is it not true in low dimensions? Well, one first point to make is that in low dimensions, you don't have black holes in the standard sense. And quantum gravity theories like JT gravity are renormalizable. And they just work. They don't need 
brains and strings and stuff to form a UV completion. They're just fine on their own. And so that's one difference. But let me give you another perspective. So in general, many swampland conjectures are violated in low dimension, um, such as on the string world sheet. So for example, the string world sheet as a theory of 2D quantum gravity has global symmetries. It has current algebras and target space Poincaré symmetry are global symmetries on the string world sheet. Does the world sheet have an ensemble? And I would argue, yes. One way to see that um, is to consider, say, Wilson loop observables in a large N gauge theory. So we can calculate the partition function with the insertion of a bunch of Wilson loop observables, where here A is the gauge field of the, the gauge theory. But we can think of these as a bunch of one dimensional quantum systems, right? These are some time ordered traces of e to the i minus i or h or whatever. And so what we see is that the expectation value of Wilson loop observables looks like an ensemble average of 1D quantum systems. So if we think about this as an ensemble average, we should also now think about the Tuft expansion. So the Tuft expansion of this large N Wilson loop observ partition expectation value of Wilson loops is described by the theory of D equals two quantum gravity on the string world sheet. And so in fact, the ensemble is natural for world sheet quantum gravity. And in fact, it's implied by the standard holography of the target space theory. So what I'm saying is that the ensemble on the string world sheet is the, on, is the integration over the dynamical degrees of freedom in the target space. Um, and so we should in fact think that the ensemble is a signature that we're dealing with a world sheet theory of quantum gravity. And in fact, we are. JT gravity, although I don't think it's emphasized enough, JT gravity is a world sheet string theory. It's the world sheet of the topological B model string on this Calabi-Yau threefold, defined by this equation um, in C4. And this, you can see certain aspects, this, uh, the equation cutting out this calabi is related to the spectral curve of the dual matrix model. There's a general theory here. Um, and so the fact that JT has an ensemble is, as I understand it, reflecting the fact that JT gravity is a world sheet theory. It's a theory on a string world sheet. So what does this tell us about higher dimensional analogs of JT gravity? Well, we don't expect analogs in too much higher dimension. The one place where we might have examples is M2 brains, so D equals three quantum gravity. Um, but it's not really clear in what sense M2 brain, M theory is a theory of weakly interacting M2 brains. In fact, it's certainly not a theory of weakly interacting M2 brains. Um, it might be a theory of interacting M2 brains in some sense, but it's not so clear. We don't have a genus expansion and we don't know what it means to have M2 brain perturbation theory. In higher than, than that many dimensions, we certainly don't expect any analog. Um, and so this is, matches nicely onto the expectation that the baby universe hypothesis should hold once you get to more than three dimensions. But also I think it gives a different perspective, which is that the baby universe hypothesis, the exception isn't really about low dimensions, it's about world sheet theories, world volume theories. And so for theories of 2D gravity that you get by taking say string theory and compactifying them down to two dimensions, we still expect the baby universe hypothesis to hold. We expect them to be holographic in the standard sense. Um, okay. So any questions about that before I conclude? Yeah, do you have comments on 3D? Yeah, so 3D is borderline. Um, I know it's, it's, a, it's a very hot topic right now. Um, I, I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other, but I, if you force me to choose one, I would say I don't think it makes sense um, because I don't know that I think that M2 M theory is a theory of interacting M2 brains. Um, um, yeah, I don't know about the M2 brain thing, but I just wanted to say like, you can certainly have, it makes sense in the sense that JT does, uh, but you know, not uh, fit into your, the, the picture. Well, it, it, it passes some consistency checks, as, as you obviously know and have, have thought about. Um, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, though. I don't think the path integral has been done in anywhere near the detail of, like, Sachanker Stanford, 
it's possible that it could turn out that way. I, yeah, it, no, no way. Exactly. Th that, that's my perspective. It's possible that it could turn out that way, um, but it's much harder. Um, and the reason it's much harder is just because three manifold geometry is, and topology is much, much harder than two manifold geometry. We don't have it. For one reason, yeah. yeah. Um, there was no. a nice discussion about, <laughs> sorry? It only gets worse. It only gets worse, exactly. And there, there was a nice discussion about this during strings. Um, and Ed Witten was saying that, you know, the sense in which three manifolds are classified is that there's seven geometry types and then one which is everything else. So it's not really, yeah. it's yeah. not clear what should play the role of the string coupling. He likes to say that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, it's a good point. <laughs> um, it's a good point. Um, and I, I, I agree that it's conceivable that it might work out like, um, like JT gravity, and I think it's an important question whether it does, yeah. but certainly not in more than three dimensions, at least. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Where guess, it's not renormalizable. Yeah, to clarify my initial question, it's like, it's not at all clear to me that uh, the only way it could consistently be resolved um, mm -hmm. and be similar to JT is as a world volume theory of M2 brains. Oh, um, so the, the point we're making here is that the ensemble um, is a signature of the fact that there's some more general target space theory that the object is a part of. Yeah. Um, when I say it's not all clear to me, it's because I haven't thought about it before. It could very well. Yeah, be. yeah. So I, I, I don't know that I'm saying that the ensemble means that there's a nice geometric target space theory, um, but I think that it's a signature that this theory of quantum gravity with the ensemble is not, we shouldn't think of it as like target space string theory. We should think about it as like world sheet string theory. Um, uh, I understand. Yeah. Uh, and that might, there might be a lot to glean from that. So nice. Yeah. yeah. Um, in particular, you know, whether we should call JT gravity a complete theory of quantum gravity, I think is a matter of taste. Um, it's certainly a well-defined path integral and it's dual to a, exactly dual to an ensemble of unitary quantum systems. But I don't know whether we're supposed to think of it as quantum gravity. It's a path integral over geometries, but it doesn't have a black hole information paradox. It doesn't solve, um, it's not holographic. Um, I, I'm not sure in what sense it's, but we're supposed to think about it as analogous to like the theory of quantum gravity we're sitting here living in. Um, I have my own feelings, but, uh... This is very yeah. valid uh, debate. Yeah. 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 No, it, it's a, it's an important it's an important subject of debate for sure. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So let me let me wrap up, um, and then we can we can chat more. I'm happy to chat. Um, so in this talk and in this paper, um, we've argued that the baby universe hypothesis, first of all, does successfully resolve the tension between Euclidean wormholes and holography if you just take it as a given. Um, I've also argued that it fits neatly into the growing web of swampland conjectures, and so it should be our expectation from the perspective of a swampland program. And finally, it's consistent with the standard interpretation of ADS-CFT, and so if you think that that's something that we should expect, then I think that's further evidence for the baby universe hypothesis. A very strict reading, um, uh, Jeff uh, Pennington, it is Jeff, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah. Spelled differently than I'm used to, but yeah, Jeff Pennington. Like um, Jeffrey Chaucer or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, he described this perspective as radical holographism, and I really like that because that's exactly what it is. It's a it's a very radically strict t interpretation of holographic principle. It's not in an emerge. It's not in a wishy washy sense. It just it's straight up on the nose equivalent of quantum equivalence of quantum systems. So let me just leave you with what I think is the, the most unclear part of this and the part that really needs more study, which is even if I've claimed that the baby universe hypothesis should be the end result of your calculation, how do you know before you do the calculation that it's going to be the case, it's going to hold? How could it be realized microscopically in quantum gravity? Is it a miracle? Um, is it just that, you know, we write down everything we can and sometimes we get lucky and it satisfies this baby universe hypothesis. I don't really think so. Um, I think that quantum gravity has more structure than that. And I think the key to understanding the structure is to gain a better understanding of these gauge redundancies described by Jaffer, Merrill, and Maxfield. 
So these gauge redundancies are not like a quotient by a gauge group. It's not that there's just some gauge fixed variables that you know, are the, the, the quotient space of fields by a gauge group. It's something more subtle. It's something uh, that has more structure. And I think that there's a lot of work to be done in understanding exactly what that structure is. How can we quantify it? How can we control it? And in particular, how can we know beforehand that we're gonna end up with a one-dimensional Hilbert space at the end of the day? So what, can, what, what do we need to put into the path integral to get this result out? Um, so that's, that's, that's the talk. Um, thank you guys so much for listening. Thanks for the questions. This was really, um, this was really fun. Yeah, this was uh, fascinating, Jake, and uh, it really helped me um, where, you know, I felt like I didn't really have a full handle on uh, exactly what you and Cameron had done, and I certainly didn't put in the work <laughs> to read your paper. No problem. That's why, <laughs> that's why you invite people for talks. Uh, yeah, I guess. Um, so what I'm going to do is uh, turn off the recording now, and um, cool. we can have, uh, you know, more informal uh, questions if there are any, or we can... Uh, re release Jacob. So, yeah. <laughs>